So yeah, I'll get my DJ Chiba. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so I've been living in Bristol for 20 years and kind of forged, shoehorned, fought my way into a career DJing, which is a tough thing in the world. More so tough in Bristol. You know, everyone's a DJ, right? You all DJ? Yeah, this is pretty much the story of Bristol. You go around Tesco's and it's the same story. <laughs> Everyone's a DJ. Um, so I kind of class myself now as an audiovisual DJ. I've kind of tried to carve a niche for myself doing audiovisual sets, but I come from a very much turntable vinyl, turntablist background. I kind of grew up watching DMC videos, got really inspired by that and wanted to be a part of that. Um, really wanted to be a part of music, wasn't really classically trained in anything, had some sort of percussive skills, but was really kind of taken by hip hop and scratching sounds. Um, Pump Up The Volume, you know that track? Yeah. By Mars, it's a big scratch solo in the middle by CJ Bolland, or CJ McIntosh even. And I think it was on like Now 8, and I was like, what is that? She's kind of like the rocket moment that q talks about. So that's kind of where I came from. I really wanted just to get involved in that, learn how to make those sounds. And I never, at that point, being a teenager, I never thought of DJing as performing to people. I wasn't really in my interest at all. I just wanted to be a part of it. Got into that and then that kind of progressed, moved up to Bristol and opportunities came around, started promoting club nights. Uh, did 15 years with Ninja Tune, promoting club nights for them in Bristol. Got out of promoting because it's a mugs game and it's much better to be on the artist end of it where your fees are guaranteed and you can pay your rent rather than gambling. <laughs> it's up to you if you want to take that route, but you know, it wasn't for me anyway. Um, so yeah, I've kind of uh, studied audio editing at UE and also video editing as well. I had a background in video editing. so. I kind of got into DJing, Serato came around, I got really excited by that, about the thought that I could have two copies of everything. I used to spend my life digging for a second copy of the things I wanted so I could beat juggle. And it was like, wow, Serato, I can play my own edits. I've got two copies of everything and there's no Q-burn. Do you know what Q-burn is? It's when you've got a vinyl record and you've scratched that sample so much that needle has just like wrecked that groove to bits and you get this nice hiss. So that was really exciting for me and then um, started working with Serato and Rain and the video capabilities came in. I got really excited by that, put a music video into the system, was like, wow, this is pretty cool. And then all my video editing history kind of triggered and I was like, wow, what if I made like sample sentences with video and started editing and this all just snowballed. And now I'm doing things like rescoring movies for the BFI, I've done um, art installations with the watershed, recently done a thing about Steve Reich. Um, getting more and more into video, doing projection mapping and stuff like that. Really tried to diversify as I've got older, more tired and not so many touring opportunities. I need to be at home more with my family. And so kind of tried to diversify my skill set into that sort of stuff. Um, I'm going to stop rambling because you don't want to see me ramble. It's Christmas, isn't it? Um, I'll do a bit of something and then we'll talk some more. Hi, Mr. DJ. Hello. Hi. Hello. 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 Each year at Christmas time, we take a moment to reflect on the important events of the last year. Oh my goodness, it's a visit from Father Christmas. Would you please just give your Christmas message to the nice people of Great Britain? Okay, this one goes out to all the mods, rockers, toffs, dossers, kits, twits, chimney sweeps, flocks of sheeps, hooligans, 007s, and a smashing bird named Queen Elizabeth. Happy Christmas. 25 years ago, 
My grandfather broadcast the first of these Christmas messages. Today is another landmark because television has made it possible for many of you to see me in your homes on Christmas Day. All right, you people, get ready to cheer for the Christmas show at the Burning Spear. All you hip hops are in for a treat because Santa Claus is on Beach Street. Open up your door. Uh it's Christmas time. It's Christmas time. It's Christmas time. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, it's that time of year, isn't it? <laughs> I'll fill up. I do some actual stuff now. Just like normally I do a lot of theme shows, you know? So I've been done Valentine's show, stuff like that, doing them at the canteen, just video vaults of stuff, remix them live, have some fun with it, have a laugh. And uh, I haven't got a Christmas show this year, so you got it, or a bit of it. Um, so yeah, we'll do some proper shit. Just what is it that you want to do? I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell. Get the fuck out! Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? Stop what you're doing and listen, listen, listen. Wake up, children of Babylon. Our time is coming. We come from the shadows. We are watching. Shall we play a wicked play a dip 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 game? We are waiting. We are everywhere. Yeah, I know the name. The C, the C, the H, the H, the E, the E, the A, the A, the C, the C, the H, the H, the E, the E, the A, the C, the C, the H, the H, the E, the E, the A, the A, the C.
crystal of city. Bristol, Rocket like rocket fuel. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? The end of the line, yes. It's finished. It's over. Nothing is over. Nothing. Yes, it is. Oh, you're really kind. <laughs> Thanks, man. So yeah, that was kind of just like showing you some examples of like how I was using video, but also 
bringing in some of the turntablism, using the camera to accentuate that because kind of trying to translate stuff that's so intricate and small and close up in an audience this big it's okay on a big stage with lots of people in the dark who have all been it's a bit harder to translate <coughs> and you're just one little guy with essentially some little kit possibly on a massive stage and it's a long lonely walk out there and it's good to have the big screen it kind of helps you know drive some branding people come to your show they you know they, or a festival they may not know who you are you can kind of keep delivering this name uh, people know who you are instead of going oh who's this guy he's really good oh, i saw this good guy at this show but i don't know who he was so i kind of use video for that i've always used samples in my mixtapes you know like um movie clips and stuff i'm a bit of a movie nerd like that or tv nerd and uh it kind of works in the mixtape. You listen to it in a car and there's a bit of dialogue and it's funny or it's referencing or something like that. But in a big show, it doesn't really work. But with video, you can see the lips moving. It gets across to a bigger audience much better. Um, I've also kind of like come from a mixtape background. I'm kind of like, see, making mixtapes is a full on art form, you know, at one end of it, you've kind of got the Avalanches or DJ Shadow are essentially making albums that are just super intricate mixtapes, really, you know. And uh, DJing doesn't have to be, you know, a USB stick playing one song after the other. It can be so much more than that. It can be multiple DJs. You can really treat it like an instrument, looking at arts like C2C or like Beat Junkies or whatever. Cool, so many of you use Serato, or are you all using CDJs? What's the kind of arms up using software like Serato and Tractor and stuff. So about half. The rest of you using CDJs, record box, or not DJing. <laughs> cool, so I use Serato. Um, it was just kind of, when it came out, it was stable. This was the biggest thing. When I first heard about Final Scratch, which was the thing that came out from Stunt, and it was really unstable. The idea was great, but it was really unstable. Serato came out from New Zealand, it was really stable and kind of lent itself to people from a turntable background. I know like you can, using software like Tractor and stuff like that with stems, you know, they had four decks from a really early on. So it kind of lent itself much more to doing stem type stuff, definitely with house techno, drum and bass, stuff like that. Whereas Serato was much more made by turntablists for turntablists. So I kind of jumped on that ship and eventually started working with them. But uh, yeah, going back to making mixtapes, I just wanted to show you some of my process for making mixtapes. Um, I really like to work to a theme. I mean, I've done mixtapes where I'm just like, oh, just choose some of my favorite songs, maybe current songs or songs from history. But I really like working to a theme, whether that's commissioned or just a stupid idea in the pub. Or in this case, I've got a quote called Claire 80s. And my wife's called Claire and she likes the 80s. And we were watching Janet Jackson at Glastonbury. And uh, after watching it, she knew I was going to bang on about um, the sound of the snares of Janet Jackson's, because it all sounds the same. And then looking more into it, all the 80s, you know, the 80s, the sound of the 80s was defined by the snare. Am I right or wrong? <laughs> Music lecturers here. For me, it was definitely defined by the sound of the snare. But so what I've done is um, I gathered up as many 80s songs as I could remember, and I remember the 80s pretty well, and then kind of went digging. I went, um, listened to other people's 80s mixtapes as well. You know, if you're looking for inspiration, I'm sure there's probably a smooth 80s radio station I could have dug into, but I listened to other people's mixtapes and uh, kind of went back over my own history of 80s stuff and started gathering stuff here. And that's, uh, can you read that? Uh, so yeah, I was kind of going for like a dancey vibe of 80s stuff. Again, working to a theme, it kind of, it closes it down much more. Your options are much more closed down. And for me, with all the options of every piece of music or audio in history, every piece of video is just too big and I find it a bit scrambling. The more, the more very narrow the theme, I find it easier. Because I'm like, right, that's my pot. And I will make it work 
or shoehorn it or do whatever. But I've kind of got a process for how I kind of give myself the best chance of it. So what I do is I get all the tracks, I chuck them into, into a Serato crate, um, analyze them, and then we get all their BPMs and their keys, and I list them by BPM. Um, and then generally have a play with it, you know, just at home mucking about, see what works with what. Obviously trying to look at stuff that's in key or in, um, where we go in it. So here, this was kind of, dunk, I just listed it by BPM. Generally making a mixtape, I'd list it by BPM first and then kind of look into groups. So I'd chuck them into groups in Ableton of like a 10 BPM range, something like that. So here I was just kind of dunk straight away and I'm like, wow, the Stranger Things intro is 84 BPM and it's 9A. And then there's Kim Wilde, it's got that same keyboard thing. So already Serato's throwing up ideas for me. When I first got Serato, it was just throwing ideas at me because I was, had a catalogue of music and it was like, why don't you try this? It's like having a really good friend go, you should try this. And um, yeah, my daughter even told me about this as well. So Kim Wilde, Stranger Things. So anyway, I chuck them into uh, Ableton. <coughs> Boom. Old Ableton 8. Um, chuck them in, quantize them. I quantize most of the stuff I put in there just because it makes it easier to put them into tracks like that and then I can rearrange it. So once I've got a track in, I'll chop it up, kind of make it DJ friendly, find if there's a drum loop in there, I'll pull that out, make an extended loop of that just so I've kind of got a DJ friendly edit of everything before I start trying to put things together. In this instance, I knew that these three would all go together in key and in tempo. We've got like Falco's Rock Me Amadeus, Kim Wilde and Stranger Things theme. Um, where we go in? Uh, Got that same synth hit, one finger, comet is coming type thing. I gotta say, if you know my wife, don't tell her about this. This is like, this is my cheapo Christmas present, right? <laughs> but yeah, I just wanted to, it was just a good example of how I'm building a mixtape at the moment based on a random theme. And so, yeah, I chop them all up, quantize them, and then it gives me the freedom to move them around and really experiment at that point. Um, and same with Rock Me Other Days. I think mean, that's a good example of shoehorning it together. I knew that the, um, they'd fit in key and I knew they'd fit in tempo, but there's no real out point out of Kim Wilde, so I took the synth line at the start and whapped it at the end, put some ping pong echo on the vocal and shoehorning. It's like, you can make things work if you just keep on like trial and error, badgering away. Soon you kind of figure out tricks for yourself. So yeah, I mean, 80 snares, they're so good. You get the idea. Yeah, so I basically I'd arrange them into groups of 10 BPM, play with them, sort them out, and then I might export those stems again. So export them as stems, put them back into Serato, and then I've got them all at the same pitch. They're DJ friendly edits, and maybe I'll play with the arrangement in Serato as well. It's not just like, I've done it in Ableton and now I'm kind of tied to Ableton. I move back and forth a lot, because I might find, oh, there's some like cuts I could do on this. There's some good sounds in it that I could fuck with. Um, do you want all that? Where am I? Yeah, I think it's now you've kind of got the option to mix stuff in key and harmonize things, and it's so easy to do, then you really should do it. Because <laughs> it's just, it works towards creating this seamless mix, which is when like DJing is really satisfying, when it's really, really seamless. Things like open drums and stuff, that's when you can start taking cheats and not doing stuff that's in key. 
Um, so yeah, that's my process for making mixtapes. I go through back and forth between Serato. Uh, just forcing things to happen. New kids on the block into Paul Rabdul. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> yeah, I've got no credibility left, do you? <laughs> I've got cred with my kids. <laughs> um, yeah, so just talking about the equipment I use, obviously that's the equipment I use for making mixtapes. For doing video, I kind of add another process in there. I use um, Ableton a bit for video because the warping capabilities are so great. Um, but most of these final cut, I kind of, <coughs> once I've got those stems at that tempo, I'll drop them back in, maybe cut videos to it. Um, but for actual hardware use, I'm kind of, yeah, like I say, I'm using Serato, so I'm using like Serato built-in mixer. Um, this is a Rain 72, You've seen these before? It's pretty sweet, man. It's basically, it's, um, it's built on a battle mixer. So it's kind of got all this open space here. Um, performance pads here, which is kind of an idea that came from Novation Twitch years and years ago, but now it seems pretty standard in mixes. Performance pads for cues, um, tone play, loops. You know, there's more than you could ever use. They're creative options, but there's masses of them there. If you haven't got, you know, access to a mixer like this, which I don't suppose many people have, but using like MIDI controllers, if you're using Serato or even CDJs, using MIDI controllers just opens up so much stuff to you creatively. Being able to get at cue points, even you've got CDJ 2000 and you're like, these tiny little buttons, there's no drumming, there's no like, it just opens it all up so much more. Uh, effects units, um, it's great to use effects, um, especially with scratching. On this one, I can control it from a foot pedal. You may have heard me scratching and having phasers come in and stuff like that. That's really useful for me because I want to be turning effects on and off while I'm scratching. Um, I'm using phase controllers. Do you know what phase is? No. They're like um, little, let's call them Wi-Fi remotes. They talk to this receiver here and they go into the line inputs. All this does is map the rotation. So it does that. And it maps the rotation. For me, like, turd table is the weak point was the stylus. On a big stage, the stylus is, was forever tripping me up, dust on the needle, I'd be taking them off, licking them, blowing them, cigarettes with vodka on the end, trying to clean them out. Uh, phono leads getting cracked, especially when you're using other people's decks. Earth problems, and now these are, these are literally just plugged in, and they turn, and then I'm using these. So no woes with vibration, stuff like that. So for me, this was like, when this came out, I was so excited to be rid of styluses. And also, you know, super expensive. <laughs> styluses to replace them all the time. These are going to pay for themselves in no time at all. Um, what else have we got? Yeah, I was talking about MIDI controllers. Uh, yeah, the discs. I'm pretty excited about the discs as well. So these aren't vinyl. These are acrylic. Um, super lightweight, which is wicked for scratching super thin slip mats and they've actually got like a dotted groove on them which gives you more grip and I put this marker on it it means like I can count rotations and counting rotations is um, critical when you're beat juggling or scratching so you're not I think with this mixer it's great it's got this screen so you can see the waveforms in front of you but you don't want to be one of those guys who's just like buried in his laptop it's not entertaining people are people are watching you know so i use the markers to see the rotation so i can effectively kind of say i've got samples at different rotations um i've got a good example of that so what um these turntables are turned at 33 and a third so what i can do is i can build sample sentences to obey the rotations Does that make sense so if i had um if I had an Ableton session open at 33 and a third BPM and placed a sample on, the f on every beat, the sample would appear once every rotation. Then we can do multiples of that. So 66, you'd get one at the top and one at the bottom. And then 100, third, 
and you get one there. You can't see what I'm doing. One there, one there, and one there. I'll just quickly show you how to do that. Because, I mean, I think it's just important to try and get away from looking at your laptop. If you're using a your laptop, great. But um, you don't want to be that guy who's just staring into his laptop. There's a, there's a website for people like that. It's called Serato Face, if you ever want to look that up. Did it, did it, did it, did it. Right, so you can see that. Let's open this up. Okay, so in this example, I've got um, I've got an Ableton session set up at 100 BPM. So I'm looking to place my samples at 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 8 o'clock. Um, you can obviously do that to the beat grid. What I've done is I've put a beat to it. It just makes it easier for me to personally. You can do it to the beat grid if you want. I've done it to a beat and then trying to place samples on it. Uh, i show you what I mean. Ladies and gentlemen. Alright. So here we've got kick, snare, kick, snare. So those three, you can see my mouse head there. So those three represent the three points. You've got 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 8 o'clock. And then that just repeats. So these are the samples above it. And just thinking about where they're going to place. So I know this one's going to be at 12 o'clock. And, and that's going to be at the next 12 o'clock. So that's going to be a whole revolution pass. And I can keep placing all right, it. Baby. Okay, all. So there, and then what I do is I open that up, splice that, and drag that to the beat, and just keep up this kind of behavior. Uh, let me just do a splice there, export there. One hundred samples, call it something like that. Get back into Swato, load that in. Drop that down here. Load that up with any luck. <laughs> this might backfire. Uh, so if I put a cue point there. <laughs> So if I start that one at 12 o'clock, in theory, the next one should start on the next rotation. Ladies and gentlemen. Ah. So it's gone a full rotation. All right, baby. Oh. This one's landed on the eight o'clock. Okay, y'all. Ah. That one's gone at the four. Ah. That's at the eight. So now I can play those samples. Uh, where are we going? Examples. Just put a beat there. Just bring that volume down a bit. So now I can move through those samples without looking at the screen, without looking at that, but I know, I know where those samples are going to land, so I'm just looking at the record and using those rotations. So it's just it's a it's a really sweet trick for if you're using turntables it works on CDJs as well you know because you kind of got that scrolling little thing that goes around but it works really well with DVS so you can mark out your points and it's just multiples of 33 it's like bringing the fun of math to DJ <laughs> kind of yeah using samples like I said I've used samples a lot um, I really like cross-referencing stuff I like to kind of make mixtapes that warrant repeat listening. I don't know if you've heard mixtapes like that where you listen to it and you listen to it again, you keep on hearing new things. It's like watching a film and you're like, oh, I've never really got that bit. Um, so I like to do that. I've um, got some tricks to share with you about samples. Um, I do a lot of wordplay stuff. So say if I had some samples and I wanted to do some, uh, get one sample to talk to another. You could look for key phrases. 
So I was doing a show called Double Vision and I was trying to think about um, things that might rhyme with vision and things like mission. So I was like, oh, I wonder what samples I can find that say like on a mission and then double vision and then kind of work through that and kind of build up this catalog of rhyming samples, stitch them together using that, um, that idea of putting them in to places and then uh, work through them, works really well. Um, where are we going? Yeah, so I'll show you where, how I do that and there's a big cheat for this. So you can use a thing called Subzin, which is a free website. What it does is it searches, um, searches subtitles of films and it's amazing how good you can get sentences. I mean, you've got to find the films but say I was looking for, you know, DBS, for example. You scroll down, try and find something that you think you can probably find. None of this, or something that's got a good sample in it. Uh, in this example, like Top Gear. And it'll say, at 40 minutes and 23 seconds, one of those three Berts is going to say Aston Martin DBS. You find that episode trawl for it. It's a little laborious, but sometimes it's, it's a fun thing to do. Uh, so, you know. DBS, DBS. And that took me all of like two minutes. Uh, and the same goes for like rap acapellas as well. If you want to get samples of stuff that's saying certain things, you can do another database called uh, Rap Genius which searches lyrics of rap songs. Uh, once I've done this, once I've found a, like a likely candidate, in this case, there's like a Pusha T thing I found. And you can scroll down, you can see all the lyrics there and you can find, see where he says DBS is here somewhere. Yeah. Um, I'd have a listen to that, see how that sounds. Probably terrible. I think, oh, that's quite cool. Maybe you could search for an acapella of that. It's always worth looking to see if there's acapellas. You can find those on acapella for you if they exist. If they exist, they're probably on YouTube. You can find them that way. So they're just like some ways to find some spoken word samples if that's what you're looking for, if you're making tracks or if you're DJing and you're looking for specific phrases. Certainly if you want to bounce phrases off each other, they're both wicked resources, subs in especially. Um, yeah, I mean, loads of my stuff comes from memory as well. I've got a bit of a memory for movie quotes and stuff like that. So kind of using that and subs in and that, you can kind of build up these catalogs of um, spoken word and samples. Uh, what else do we go with? Yeah, I think um, I kind of wanted to talk today about being unique and having a niche as well, you know, because like I said, in Bristol, especially everyone's a DJ and everyone's doing stuff. A lot of you are producing music, right? So this is like a really good angle in. If you're making your own music, you can, you know, it's a platform to present your own music, which is wicked. Um, put you in circles with people who might run labels and stuff like that. So that's a really good angle. Uh, for me, that wasn't what I wanted to do. I really was much more into the technique of it. So you see people getting really into scratching and stuff, doing DMCs, that's like another angle. Just trying to find a niche to exploit. For me, I kind of found myself going into this AV route and it's kind of worked out pretty well and I've managed to diversify as well. Um, but I think that's, it's really important to have some sort of identity as well, you know. You might have a really cool DJ name, you might have like, some wicked threads and you might have wicked tune but you know trying to present some style and uniqueness I think is critical especially if you're on a stage you know if you're on a stage essentially showing off your music or your skills or whatever then like being able to present that in a unique way and stand out is tough it's tricky you know people put stupid things on their head marshmallow dead mouse you know, they'd do anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people go back to 45s, you know. There's this whole thing about getting so involved in technology and everything like this, and now there's this big push. It's gone back to collecting 45 records, you know. 
people are, you know, and that's the thing, that's a marketable thing, and that's doing really well for those guys. It's an expensive thing, <laughs> crazy expensive, but, you know, that's, that's their USP, if you like. Sounds really whack to be using the word USP, but, like, it really is. Um, and, like I said before, I've, like, kind of tried to diversify as well. So I came from DJ and I still DJ. Um, I try and I like to DJ to themes, um, but also I've been networking a lot and being in festivals and venues and stuff like that, meeting people, meeting sound crew, talking to everyone, you know, club owners, club promoters, sound men, lighting guys, trying to like always like pinch bits of info, um, knowing how to set everything up, knowing how everything works. Like, you need to know that. The amount of, like, DJs I booked as a promoter who had, like, Serato on their rider and didn't know how to set it up, honestly, it was sickening. It's like, you need, if you want to use this stuff, you need to know how it works. You know how it runs to the desk. If you're caught at a festival and there's a problem, you need to be able to troubleshoot, right? So just knowing all that stuff inside out is critical. I mean, I got into the video stuff and I've managed to diversify and do more stuff. I mean, it's put me in front of a computer more, but I've kind of got more into projection mapping, like taking my video output and putting it into interesting spaces, doing shows that aren't necessarily for the dance floor, like weird as a beard stuff. Um, like I said, it's like soundtracking movies in cinemas, um, doing art installations, I've done backdrops of fashion shows. You know, just like building a network of contacts and sort of creative people around you that you can bounce off, ask questions, and you'll feed each other. You know, this is, you know, it's a friendly game where everyone looks after each other. Yeah, I mean, you, you've got to enjoy it, right? You enjoy DJing. You see enough people who like treat it like it's a chore, you know? You've got to be having it. <laughs> you've got to look like you're enjoying it laugh it off you know people are looking at you to to make their night really and if you're like stony faced too cool for school it's not going to do it unless you've got you know the tunes i suppose but you know trying to find a balance between those things bring all of that um also like keeping inspired is tricky you know most of you are judging in the dark, much younger than me, but it's like, it's tough to stay inspired because you know, you're gonna get burnt, you're gonna get burnt in this industry a lot, you're gonna get walked on, you're gonna get ripped off. <laughs> you're gonna get ripped off. <laughs> At some point, somebody won't pay you. It's tough to, yeah, it's, to stay inspired is critical. You know, look around you, look around the people you work. You guys are so lucky having each other here to bounce ideas off. You know, I bet there's people who are like mad good at like um, presets on Ableton and I bet there's mad people who are really good at Serato and you know, having that knowledge pool is like, I wish I had that man. So I've kind of created that network for myself. Um, but also like looking further afield to people who are like really nailing it, you know. Um, I'm, in, I'm still inspired, I still watch tons of YouTube um, keeping up with people who blow my mind continuously. Um, some of the videos I come back to. I mean, some of these videos I come back to and they are super old, but continue to like remind me that my work isn't done. Do you know, there's always somewhere else to go. Don't sort of sit on your laurels thinking like, I'm a badass because there's always someone more badass than you. Cubert's more badass than all of us put together. And I watch this to remind myself that, like, a treat scratching a bit like training, you know, like you're at the gym, but you don't have to go anywhere, you don't sweat so much. But I, use, I watch this a lot to remind myself to, like, not be so busy, like, especially with the crossfader, and just to get really musical without using the crossfader.
just like the variation from one sound, you know, no fader, nothing, just like, it's like, damn, I've got a long way to go before I'm like grand mixer level, you know? So staying inspired, like, I find that super inspiring to just know that I've got a long way to go. And like my work's never done. And, you know, someone can overtake you, but for sure. So there's always, you know, there is no boundaries, man. There's no boundaries. You guys ever DJed with other people? More than two decks, more than four decks. Use decks like instruments. There's like crews like C2C and stuff who are like really took turntablism and made it musical, super musical. Kid Koala, stuff like that. Kid Koala always on three decks, only uses vinyl. It's nuts. So there's always, there's always more you can do. Um, I mean, like, it's reached so far as well, like turntablism especially. I mean, it's kind of like, turntablism is really important for me and it's kind of a big part of where I came from. And to see it blowing up now and in the mainstream is super amazing, you know? It can go in so many different ways. So many different ways. I've kind of done this stuff in cinemas, but there's got to be so many other ways you can do it. So many other ways, controlling video. It's essentially sending MIDI signals. What else could you do with a turntable? What else, how could you, how could you make DJing something new? Because people have done it lots. Um, there's like a whole scene from hip hop of battling, you know, about the Red Bull three style. You've got a couple of cats in Bristol who are doing Red Bull three style. They're like 20 minute full battle DJ sets trying to outdo each other and win and this comes back to hip-hop battling mcs battling djs battling and it kind of raises the level like this but for me i've never been into that i've much more been into jamming with mates get a load of turntables around doing like phrases each versus each with scratches trying to build up no time limitations no beef nothing there's no prizes there's no winners you're just like battling back and forth. Invincible Scratch Pickles, again, going back to Cuba and Mixmaster Mike and that, who were the first ones who went, we're gonna show you how we deal with this stuff because we want you to learn how to do it and we want you to be better than us so that we can learn off you. Does that make sense? So yeah, just that kind of being in this knowledge pool and sharing your knowledge with each other, bouncing off each other and jamming. You know, you've got people who make beats, you might be wicked on a machine, there might be someone else who does some scratching, it might be a video guy, just network and create some beautiful stuff, man. I think that's about all I've got to say about everything. But um, it's been a real pleasure to come down here and talk well, to you guys. Well, that's cool. Thanks for having me.